Good morning. Uh, welcome to Texas A&M University Commerce uh, College of Education and Human Services inaugural symposium entitled What Truth Sounds Like. My name is Lavelle Hendricks, and on behalf of my co-chair, Sherry Harwell, and members of the symposium committee, the Texas A&M University system are delighted to have so many of you joining us here today. This day promises to be both informative as well as challenging experience for many of you as we draw from the various disciplines from within the college to provide you with a perspective on dismantling systemic and oppressive racism. The Texas A&M University system is proud to support Texas A&M University Commerce College of Education and Human Services. Please note that for this entire experience will be recorded and for your viewing at a later time, you can visit tamuc.edu slash truth. Again, that's tamuc.edu forward slash truth to view all of the content. Please, please use our hashtag as well for today. That is hashtag T-A-M-U-C educates. That's hashtag T-A-M-U-C educates to raise interest in our event on this today. Now I'm delighted and honored to present our visionary leader and our Dean of the College of Education and Human Services, Dr. Kimberly McCloyd, who will bring us greetings. Dr. McCloyd. Good morning. Good morning. I'm delighted to have all of you here. We are excited about our first symposium. We have me, 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 around 850 people registered. And uh, me, I want to begin by... The, the president is not coming. Um, not, Dr. No, Hendrick, we can still no. hear you. Your mic is live. Dr. Hendrick, thank you. <laughs> All right. I want to begin by sharing with you a quote by James Baldwin. And he says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. When we look at racial injustice and inequities in the African-American community, it's easy to place blame and point fingers on systems or people that are external from us. It's easy to say from a lens of comfort and convenience well, they put themselves in that position. Or if it were me, this is what I would do, it's simple. Or why don't they just pull themselves up by their own bootstraps like my family did? Or why can't they just obey or do what they're told or just dribble the ball, don't engage in the social climate? Or what's so difficult about getting a job or keeping it or staying in school? It's easy to blame the African-American father or mother, the elderly grandparents for broken homes, or for rearing undisciplined children that just don't seem to fit into the culture of a school system. Pointing blame is easy, as is accepting that things cannot change, because that's just how things are. So we accept the status quo. But Baldwin says, Nothing can be changed until it is faced. What's difficult is looking at our own behaviors and mindset and honestly asking the question, is my indifference and lack of understanding contributing to the social injustice and inequity? Is my voice or my silence culpable? What's difficult to hear and accept is what truth sounds like. What does truth feel like? Is truth like a beautiful bird with wings that are capable of flight and a voice capable of song, but trapped in a cage of systemic, invisible, yet tangible realities of inequity and oppression? Maya Angelou says, I know why the cage bird sings. A life full of potential living in a cage of oppressive realities. The bird doesn't sing because he has an answer. He sings because he has a song. 
He sings because he has a story. He sings because he has a voice. He sings because that bird has a song and that song will be heard even from the confines of a cage. This symposium is not an answer. This symposium is a song. It is what the truth sounds like for African-Americans that seek to thrive, to survive, to achieve flight outside of the cage. It is what truth sounds like when other species of birds have the desire for caged birds to also experience freedom of flight. It is not an answer. It is a song. It is a song that tells a story of a collective society so that keys can be created to unlock cages. It is a song with the melody of hope that things can be better. It is not an answer. It is evidence that the bird still has voice, value, and that the song is not over. The story is not over. Progress is not over over, the melodic experience organized as a symposium would not be possible without the support of a multiracial group of volunteers that desire to create societal keys that open cages. Thank you to the organizing committee. The national chorus of individuals and panelists would not have been assembled today without the support of the university president, Dr. Mark Rudin, who has been an authentic advocate of equity and opportunity for our university, community, alums, and faculty. His contributions to this university and our community have created keys that have unlocked cages. Those cages have unlocked cages have given flight. I am living evidence. As I serve as the first African-American and female dean for the College of Education and Human Services for Texas A&M University. But just to be clear, my melanin wasn't the only thing that got me here. And our college has. Again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dobbs, for bringing the uh, greetings on behalf of uh, Texas A&M University uh, Commerce. At this time, it's my distinct honor and privilege uh, to present our first uh, keynote speaker, uh, the former United Nation Ambassador uh, and former Mayor of the City of Atlanta and our civil rights icon, uh, the Honorable Ambassador Andrew Young. Thank you very much, Lavelle, or I should say, Dr. Hendricks. Am I coming through? Yes, sir. We can hear you, Ambassador. Okay. I uh, I didn't get the dress code, uh, but I'm home, <laughs> and um, I, I wish I were. I had known, and I could have gotten as clean as you. <laughs> but. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Actually, this has been a very difficult time uh, for all of our lives. And um, it's been a difficult time for all of our lives because I think if for the first time in my 88 years, um, there and I've been through the depression. I went through World War II. Uh, I went through the early days of uh, the recovery and the civil rights movement of the fifties and sixties. Uh, and those were not easy times, uh, but they were easy for me, and they were easy for me in part because I was prepared for them. I grew up in New Orleans, and um, the neighborhood in which I was raised happened to be a working class neighborhood that forgot to get segregated. <laughs> uh, on one corner, there was an Irish grocery store. 
On another corner, there was an Italian bar. On the third corner, the headquarters of the Nazi party. Uh, and I lived right in the middle. Uh, there were other black families there, but none of them had uh, children my age. Uh, and so I had to start dealing with the problems of being different even before I went to kindergarten. And I was blessed to have a father who, standing in front of the German-American Bund headquarters, where people had a swastika flying and where they were hiling Hitler and singing Deutschland über alles. Uh, it was in 1936, uh, so there was no air conditioning. The windows were open, and we could see into the um, Nazi Party rally. Uh, and my father explained to me that white supremacy, these are white supremacists, and white supremacy is a sickness. And you have learned in Sunday school and at home that God created of one blood all the nations of the earth. And that's the truth we believe in. Uh, for some reason, things were not doing well in Germany, and they're trying to blame their problems on somebody else. And the people of German descent here uh, are admiring a fellow by the name of Adolf Hitler. He also took me to see uh, the 1936 Olympic Games in the movie tone news. In those days, it was a segregated theater, uh, but climbing up to the top and watching Jesse Owens uh, win the 100-meter dash and become christened the world's fastest human. Uh, and this didn't go well with Hitler's white supremacy. And so rather than give him his medal, uh, he and his stormtroopers marched out of the stadium. And my father said, now, normally people might get upset at being um, uh, ignored that way. Opinion. That people might get ignored, upset by being ignored, but Jesse Owens didn't pay any attention to that. He simply um, received his medal, kept his mind together, and went on and won three more gold medals and broke another world record. And he said, that's the way you have to deal with white supremacy. He said, you don't argue with them. Uh, you just demonstrate that given a chance, you can compete with anybody, anywhere, and the worst thing you can do is to get angry. And he always said to me, when you get angry at something, the blood rushes from your head uh, to your fist and your feet. And you either want to run or fight. And he said, neither of those would be good for you. He was just five feet four inches tall. And he said, you're probably never going to be more five, seven, or eight at most. Uh, and so, um, so he said, "You, you have to keep your wits." He said, your mind is the most powerful thing you have. And when you get angry, the blood rushes from your head and you're likely to do something stupid. He said, the, the one thing you remember all your life is don't get mad, get smart. Mad in any kind of struggle or any kind of fight. Uh, you'll find that um, you're more than likely to, to lose. Now, my, my computer is going in and off, off and on, 
I hope I'm not going off and on. Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. Yes, sir. And so that's been my approach to not only racial difficulties, but all kinds of difficulties. Because I learned that um, almost everybody has some kind of problem with anybody who's different. It happens in our families. If you have children who look like their mother and some look like their daddy, uh, they will start competition between each other over who looks most like the one that happens to be uh, the one that's most loved at that moment. <laughs> uh, and um, it um, it's something that I think every culture has to deal with. Now, America has tried to deal with it with a constitution that protects the rights of all of our citizens. But most countries don't do that. And our country is right now being put to the test uh, because we have such diversity and such conflict that we have a, we have a pandemic, health pandemic going on with the coronavirus. Um, we have a climate challenge where uh, raging in California, the hurricanes are raging in the Gulf, uh, and the ice cap is in the North Sea. Um, and whether you want it or not, or whether you admit it or not, uh, there is a climate change. There is a health challenge. Um, there is also um, an economic challenge. Uh, and on top of all of this, or maybe because of all of this, there's a technical challenge. Uh, I don't know whether you realize how much of a revolution it is, but when I was mayor of Atlanta, we had four stories, four floors of City Hall that had uh, mainframe computers that were about eight feet tall and maybe four feet square. And we had four stories in City Hall to take care of the records of Atlanta's city government. Uh, now, uh, I have in one little uh, cell phone, which I don't know how to use very well, but I could, um, th there's as much technical capacity in this one little thing that we keep in our pockets. Uh, one thing I have learned how to do with it is read. And I can download books and I can either read them or listen to them. Uh, and there must be 120 books in here and I can stick it in my pocket uh, and use it anywhere. Um, we're, we, we're in the midst of another technical revolution where artificial intelligence is going to be uh, handling a lot of things that we used to have to think about and worry about uh, and I go back to the days of a slide rule um, and uh, pencil and paper. Nobody uses that anymore. Uh, the technical problems that are challenging our society are making everybody insecure. The jobs are not being taken overseas. The jobs are being transformed uh, from human hands uh, to machines. And, and they really just don't exist anymore. Uh, I remember going to a steel mill in Gary, Indiana, uh, and there were 2,000 people on the floor. 
it moved to Korea. And when I went to Korea, I went to the same steel mill and there was nobody on the floor. Instead, there were about 20 guys up on a catwalk looking down, operating the entire factory. I mean, 20 people and the machines were doing the work of 2000 and Gary. Now that's inevitable. That, there's no way you can turn that around. There's no way you can bring those jobs back, no matter what politicians will say to you. What we're in the process of doing is reorienting an entire society. Now that makes everybody insecure and they wanna blame somebody. So they blame the immigrants and they blame the uh, black folk and they blame the tall people. In, in Rwanda, it got so serious that the tall people and the short people had a civil war. Now they were all Roman Catholics. They were all black. Uh, they all spoke the same language and had the same heritage. But a hundred years ago, somebody decided that short people and tall people needed to be separated. Short people married, short people needed to get short. Uh, tall people married, tall people, and they continued to get tall. And we had a genocide in Rwanda where over a million people were killed and nobody is quite sure why and how it happened. Uh, but that's the effect of the rapid social change uh, that we are living through in this day and time. And so when we look at race, let's don't just make it a uh, me and you problem. It really is. Uh, it's part of the rapid social change of an extremely complex and successful society. So instead of being afraid of the problems of climate change or the problems of a pandemic, or the problems of uh, an economy uh, that's in disarray, uh, or the problems of uh, law enforcement. Um, we've got to find a way to embrace these problems and accept them as challenges. Now, I, I have been privileged to do that here in Atlanta. And when I became mayor of Atlanta back in 1981, uh, Atlanta was just a million people. Uh, and um, we began to bring people together. We began to create more jobs. We began to expand our airport. And we did it not with government funds. We did it with, uh, well, we did it with Wall Street money, with private money. Uh, and we have grown Atlanta now to almost 7 million people. Um, so we, we're bound to have differences. When we first had our police force, I insisted that the police force be half and half black and white, and that a third of the police force be female, uh, mainly because women tend to use their brains Men tend to rely on brawn. Uh, now, that's not always the case, but that's my prejudicial view. And I happen to have three daughters, so I'm uh, and a son, but only one son. And so I have been trained to appreciate uh, the brain power, the creativity, the flexibility, the willingness to see things anew. Uh, from the view of the opposite sex. And I think that that's the message we've got to learn. When I first went to New York uh, for a job, and I mean, I'm from Louisiana, and we had a few people who were gay, but nobody bragged about it. I found myself in New York in the middle of uh, a whole gay society. Uh, and um, 
even my boss uh, called me into his office to explain to me that uh, he was gay and what that meant. Uh, th that was quite an adjustment for a young man just starting a family. And, but I had to learn to understand, to accept their view of life and relate to them in a way that was not threatening or that didn't reveal any of my insecurities. Uh, and, but that's just one of the adjustments. Uh, and, and there are many, and there are, I don't know about uh, Texas A&M and Commerce now, but Georgia State now has about 180 different nationalities in the student body. I, I, I guarantee you, you've got 100 <laughs> at Texas A&M, <laughs> at least. Uh, and these are people who, within the last two generations, uh, whose parents still remember coming from somewhere else. Well, I have learned and we have learned in Atlanta that that rich mixture of creativity and talent is what has made our city grow. And by embracing it and by celebrating the differences uh, and appreciating the different cultural points of view that are brought in, business is growing, culture is growing, uh, sports is doing better. Um, and uh, it's so much better than the old fashioned segregated South that I grew up in. Now, we're looking at a global reality um, in the months and years to come. And unfortunately, my view is that we should embrace this. Um, in my office, I have a globe uh, that goes around over and over and it never stops. And that's the way the earth is on which we live. Now, we have some people in power who want to stop the earth from turning. Uh, who want to reverse it to go back to an old time uh, where things were different. It, it cannot be done. And um, the world is going to continue to turn. And the inventors of technology are going to continue to invent. Uh, the creative people uh, in finance, they're going to continue to come up with new products. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, we went to the Sears Roebuck catalog. <laughs> and then we wiped out Sears. Sears went to the suburbs, forgot poor people. Uh, and lo and behold, here comes computers and Amazon taking over the whole thing. And all of our shopping malls are doing a little bit different. And, and so we're going to have to reinvent uh, the way we shop. We're going to have to reinvent healthcare. Uh, we're looking right now for viruses. I mean, uh, and those viruses have been around a long time, uh, but uh, we were not exposed to them as we are now. But the world travel, the fact that we, we have an airport that brings in 107 million people last year. Uh, that means that new viruses, their new diseases, their new challenges health-wise uh, that are coming from all over the world and that we're taking all over the world. And so I'd rather look at this as a challenge that's an opportunity not something to fear. And I have trust in this country. I have trust in our religious values. I have trust in our brain power. Uh, and 
I really believe in our Constitution. We don't live up to it, but the truths are there, and we're committed to those truths. Once we decide to pursue them together, uh, we will create a completely new way of doing everything. And it will be better, it will be cheaper, it will be healthier, and it'll be more fun. <laughs> uh, just stop for a minute. And I can remember in Alabama when George Wallace was standing in the door, saying, segregation now, segregation forever. <laughs> See? Well, it was Bear Bryant, the football coach, that said, hold on. Uh, if we stay segregated, well, he actually went to the Rose Bowl and there was a halfback, um, I think it was with Penn State, that just ran rings around him. Uh, and he came back and he said, I don't care what color they are, we got to have some of the speed if we're going to continue to play football. <laughs> and uh, when Alabama decided to allow black Alabamans to join the football team, uh, they ended up uh, more than likely, they're almost always considered to be in the top five. I think that same lesson can be learned and must be learned about our faith, about our life, about our politics, about our education. And I was always impressed with uh, Texas A&M at Commerce because there seemed to be that passion for creativity and that the people who were there, diverse backgrounds, uh, different ideas, different upbringing, but they were willing to take on the challenges of today's world together and create uh, a much better, a world more like the kingdom of God. And so that's why I, um, well, I, in spite of all of the troubles, uh, I've always found that the Lord will make a way out of no way. <laughs> and it's only when the way gets dark that we begin to see a new light in the distance. <clears throat> and I'm waiting on that light. In the meantime, we've got to seek it in ourselves, in our neighbors, in our friends, in our politics, and we've got to vote for the light. We've got to vote for the future, but we've got to vote because that's the way you translate ideas into reality in a democracy such as ours. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ambassador, very much. If you would mute yourself, Ambassador, and uh, we will come back to you in a few minutes with questions. But if you would mute, thank you so much. Okay, I think somebody will do that. I won't say anything. <laughs> thank you, Ambassador Young. You're reminded to place your questions and comments in the chat box. I'm sure at this point we have many comments and questions, and we'll get to those after Dr. Ford's keynote. Dr. Donna Ford began her life as a gifted student, denied by one, encouraged by many. That encouragement was sufficient enough to cause her to receive a bachelor's degree in communications in Spanish, a master's in counseling, and a PhD degree in urban education and educational psychology from Cleveland State University, all in a span of seven years. Dr. Ford held for, for, uh, professorships at the Ohio State University, Vanderbilt University, the University of Virginia, and presently she has returned to the Ohio State University. Dr. Ford has written 300 articles and book chapters. She's made more than 2,000 presentations at professional conferences. 
Many of those conferences were at the, for the Texas Association for Gifted and Talented. She has served as author, co-author, and co-editor of 14 books. In gifted education, we like to claim her as our own, and I'm sure <laughs> special education feels the same way. But her reach is definitely in gifted education, but also extends beyond GT to issues addressing the achievement gap, to issues addressing culturally competent teacher training and development, to issues addressing African-American identity, to issues addressing African-American family involvement. Dr. Ford has most certainly been singing the same song for a long time. I've heard her song and I'm delighted that we both will hear her song again. Dr. Ford, she will probably tell you that she is the mother of Kyle L. Ford and the proud grandmother of Kyle Jr. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Donna Ford. Wow, Dr. Miller, what a fantastic um, introduction. And you really captured who I am. And I want to say I'm in awe from hearing and being on a panel or platform with um, Dr. Young. So, but I, we only have a short amount of time. So there's so much I would want to say. Uh, and, and thanks to you and um, the university, the conveners for um, having this platform and having me be a presenter. So um, I apologize, instead of visuals, I do have some notes because I wanna stay focused for the time um, that I have, all right? So um, Dr. Miller, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. So this theme is what truth sounds like. And I'm gonna uh, change a little bit because that's a hell of a title and I love it. And I want to change it to what hard truth sounds like. And um, in my thoughts would be um, Congressman, the late Congressman John Lewis about good trouble, okay? And others. So as was just said by um, Ambassador Young, former Ambassador Young, um, we are living in you know more than one pandemic. So we got COVID-19, but I wanna claim the other pandemic is racism 1619 to the present. Um, we must have conversations that entail, that embody, that personify our uh, truths. And I wanna go with that statement that says, truth will set you free or truth can set you free. Free. So too many educators appear to be selectively hearing when it comes to the um, major omnibus R word, racism, and then anti-racism, and then anti-blackness. Too many educational leaders are bystanders fearful of white fragility, especially afraid to um, have white women's tears show up. So they avoid a pedagogy of discomfort. And I believe in the pedagogy of discomfort. I mean, how can you be where you are and move out of where you are without discomfort? Too many educator, educational leaders are bystanders. And again, just fearful of white fragility. Racism is operating like cancer. It's a plague in our damn educational system. Peter 12 and higher education. But there are treatments like cancer. And there are some cures like cancer for those who want to take the opportunity to um, get the treatment. 
So someone's like, nah, I'll just um, keep being like I am. Okay, you're cancerous. You're cancerous to the educational system. Our black children are experiencing racial battle fatigue and post-traumatic stress disorder. And let me correct that. Not just post-traumatic stress disorder, but present traumatic stress disorder which I'm thinking I coined that phrase present, but maybe not. Um, but this trauma um, has existed. And I wrote this in recently in Diverse Issues in Higher Education under the um, leadership of Dr. Jamal Watson, who has given me a platform and a blog to share the horrendous experiences of Black students in particular. So I'm gonna, I, I gotta give a shout out to Dr. Watson. So sarcasm, and this is with support. Um, we have resource officers that, I mean, I'm sorry, more resource officers than counselors in our schools, which feed the corrupt, and I wanna repeat that, to corrupt school to prison pipeline. So these are some hard truths and I'm not finished. Under, so we have miseducation, Carter G. Woodson. And as my dear friend and colleague here at OSU says, we have educational malpractice, which is my latest piece in diverse issues in higher education. So in other words, I've written that miseducation is a form of educational malpractice. And we only seem to talk about malpractice when it comes to the medical, medical profession. So our black children cannot breathe. George Floyd, one example. So I'm a member of a group, I urge consortium for the inclusion of underrepresented racial groups and gifted education. I'm sorry, um, I urge consortium for the uh, inclusion of underrepresented racial groups in gifted education, several, I mean like a dozen of us, and we wrote a paper that says, get your knee off my neck. And I'll talk about that more with the panel um, because that focuses on gifted education. But just period, get your damn knee off our neck because you are strangling our dreams and our future as black students. What hard truths sound like? There's a monopoly on education where white with white females being about 85% of the teaching force. And then, you know, pretty much the same thing with white administrators. Um, so white females, I'm, I'm speaking to you and I'm saying, you've got to get your sh stuff together. I was very cursed, and I will later. So whatever, if your children around, you just go ahead and mute me. But you got to get your stuff together because you know what? You're the problem. And then you're the major problem. And then you have the white female administrators supporting you. And when I say you're the ma major problem, I'm saying because you're the majority of the teaching profession. Blacks are 7% as the newest data from um, Condition of Education, 2020. I'm sorry, yeah, 2020. And then it's the same percentages for Hispanics, which went up a little bit. So there's so much damn collateral damage, collateral damage that we must address. And I am not going to be part of the problem. So if you've not picked it up right now, I'm angry, I'm outraged, I'm fuming, and um, the data, which I've not even given you, should compel you to do the same. So some hard truths, I'm saying get angry, get outraged. We have to deal with achievement gaps, opportunity gaps, expectation gaps, um, access gaps that can be gulfs and more. Our children cannot breathe. Again, going back to I urge and George Floyd, because 
our black children are adultified. Adultified. They can be five years old and treat it like they're 15 or 25. And don't act like you have not seen this in the news. Damn adultified. And it should piss you off. We got special education overrepresentation in terms of high incidence areas. And it would be intellectual um, disabilities. It would be uh, emotional behavioral, so to speak, disorders, um, learning disabilities. Then we have ADHD. And then we have definitely the school to prison pipeline with developmental delay, where they take our three-year-olds, three to eight-year-olds, and too often don't do what's necessary. And they definitely get a label that is um, problematic. And pro anyway, problematic. We have gifted education, underrepresentation for black students, 50% underrepresentation for black students. So over 250 something thousand black students every year who do not have access to gifted education due to racism, intentional and unintentional. So hard truth, racism is real, whether it is intended or not. And then for, it's for Hispanic students, it's about 40%, low, uh, actually, anyway, 40% for Hispanic students. Discipline, we have black students being disciplined at three times the um, percentage of our white students. And it starts in preschool. I mean, children barely out of damn diapers getting suspended. Barely out of diapers getting suspended. And so, for example, black preschoolers are 19% of our schools, yet 52%, according to the Office for Civil Rights data, of those suspended. Yeah, this is the school to prison pipeline being primed. And if you're not angry, there's a problem. This is about subjectivity and educator discretion. Educator discretion. And this is why we have this form, educator discretion. Color blindness is a problem. Culturally, a sort of learning environments is a problem. Um, culturally, a sort of curriculum where our students do not see themselves reflected in the curriculum. So what we have going on is a clear, a clear indication of deficit thinking. And um, deficit thinking is not a term I coined, but here's what I did coin, which is the less we know about others, the more we make up. So the less educators know about black children, people, families, et cetera, the more they make up. And the more they make up, the more it is problematic. So whether it is intentional or unintentional, racism exists in education. And it is um, smothering our children. It is, so this is real talk, truth. It is killing the dreams and aspirations and hopes of our children. And whether, and people talk about implicit bias. Yeah, there's implicit bias. But when we talk about implicit bias, in my opinion, it lets racists off the hook because then it can say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. It wasn't intentional. You, no, it was damn intentional. You know what you just did. So when this teacher just did this assignment where she um, or he, I'm sorry, I don't know the gender of the person or sex of the person, did an assignment this week. Well, I heard about this week where it was about um, who are uh, heroes, heroes. And on that list, it was Malcolm X. It was, I'm, I'm sorry, it was Martin Luther King Jr. It was Gandhi. But then had the freaking caudacity, and that's the term I coined, 
caudacity, not audacity, but caudacity to put Kyle Rittenhouse on that list. How the hell is he a hero? And if you don't know who he is, look him up, because I don't have time to explain that. But why in the world would any teacher think that was a damn appropriate assignment? And I don't give a frick, and I didn't curse, what, a, what year it is. So if you're not angry right now, and you should be, and I want you to be, because I'm angry, and if you're not outraged, then I'm saying your empathy and equity meters are broken. Something wrong with your equity and empathy meters. If you're not angry, just about the little bit that I share. And if I had really like, not just a keynote, like 40 minutes, I think it is. And somebody will tell me, you know, when to shut up. <laughs> um, I am outraged. So truth does not sound like silence. Silence equals and is complicity. A few more points. Um, trying to keep up with time. Okay, so what I want to go to is um, dynamic thinking. So what hard, not just truths, but what hard truth uh, sounds like. We need... Oh, I thought I heard somebody. Um, we need more diversity. Oh, man. I just realized. I went through my messages anyway quicker than I thought. But anyway, we need more diversity among educational, educational, educational professionals. And... I don't mean like your skin color. I mean, like, I don't want Clarence Thomas teaching my damn kids. I don't want that, uh, what was it, uh, police commissioner, and I may have it wrong, who, uh, who um, let those police officers from murder off the hook of Breonna Taylor, this black man, I don't want him teaching my children. I want him anyway around anybody I love or anybody you love. All right. So the term is that I write about is Negro pens. I don't want any Negro pens either. So my message is just not to, you know, whites, but it, my message is mainly to you because you're the majority. You're the majority and you will not be let off the hook. And I'm disappointed in what has been done thus far. All right, so we need more diversity. We gotta recruit more um, um, educators of color and make sure they are in leadership positions and make sure they're not afraid to speak up. They're not window dressing. I, we don't need window dressing. We need more anti-racist educators, period. We need, and so, you know, this is a university, right? Texas and MU Commerce. We need more required education, I mean, equity, diversity, and inclusion training. And it would, it's a disgrace for any university to not have professional students from all professionals get training in equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, it needs to be a, on at least four classes. All right. Okay. So Peter 12 and higher education is quiet. Um, Anti-racist work must not be a damn fad. I'm tired of this. It cannot be a trend or trendy. I'm so sick of this. And um, I know that um, the university, under the leadership of the president and the dean, did not into that. No less is my um, new president and my dean, um, Don Pope Davis, Davis. In fact, I tweeted this morning that under his leadership in two years, we are now at this predominantly white institution, Ohio State University. 30% diverse, 
Now, tell me who else can match that. That is under the leadership of my dean, Don Pope Davis. We're not 5%. We're not seven. We're at 30%. So guess what? It can't be done. Stop the damn excuses. Just stop. And I'm sick of diversity being the flavor of the week and the flavor of the month. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, actually, I am. Two more points. I want to end by saying two things. We must end drive by teaching where you drive in, get your paycheck, and you really don't care about your children, your students. And then last, if you really don't care about children, especially black children, um, because of the harm that's done, leave the damn profession. And that's what hard truth sounds like. So I'm done. And thank you, Dr. I'm sorry, uh, Andrew Young, Ambassador, for your <laughs> remarks. But and maybe you don't curse, but I do. But I'm telling educator, uh, well, who's in the profession? Leave it. Do no harm. Get the hell out of the profession. Stop harming our kids. I'm I'm done. I'll stop. Okay. Again, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador uh, Young, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Donna. Uh, Ford for your insightful comments that you have provided. Truly, uh, we are honored uh, by your presence as part of this important symposium on dismantling systemic and oppressive racism. There have been several questions that have come to us through our chat room. And the first one that would like to go to is to you, to Dr. Uh, Ford, is can you explain more on the concept of the uh, prison to uh, pipeline uh, concept that you were discussing? Uh, well, the prison, the school to prison pipeline, the school to prison pipeline is where early on um, we have children being disciplined for re for subjective reasons and for unnecessary reasons. And once they have experienced um, suspension or expulsion, for example, then they enter the in air quote system. And once they're in the system, then they are marked and then they are watched. And then if they sneeze, if they do almost anything, and I really do mean this, if they do almost anything, if they question the teacher, um, if there are so many examples, then um, they can get a referral to the principal's office and then they don't get um, in trouble again. Um, so that I'm so when I so I'm saying we have we have um, our kindergartners, our black boys in particular. No, they don't have to do anything. They're adultified. They're adultified, and just because they're black and they could be small, don't matter what their size. Um, it doesn't matter. Then teachers are intimidated by them. Or if a little white girl says, you know, uh, sheds a tear, going back to white fragility, if a little white girl says something, or if a little white girl pushes this little black boy and then he pushes her back, what does the teacher see? Oh, she sees the entire exchange, but then she adultifies the little black boy and he is the one that gets punished because the little white girl is so damn fragile, which she's not. So I'm sick of this Becky and uh, what's the other name? Uh, Karen BS. I'm sick of it. And it's not just outside of schools. It's inside of schools. We have teachers who are Karens and Beckys, and it's a problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. The next question will go to uh, Ambassador Andrew Young. Ambassador, if you are still on, the question to you is, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as you know, left this world here on April 4th, 1968. What would be Dr. King's message to black America today? Ambassador Young, if you are there, please. Yeah, well, let me say, I, I wish uh, in the day with uh, Dr. Ford, 
because I agree with everything she says, but I don't agree with her getting angry about it. I was in a meeting one time and uh, we were all angry about something and um, I, I, we were ready to do something. I think it was when, when James Meredith got shot in uh, Mississippi and everybody got all upset and I was upset too. And um, Dr. King said, uh, excuse me, I need to run to the, to the bathroom. Andy, meet me in my office. And when I got there, he said, what the hell are you doing? I said, I'm just sick and tired of this. I'm angry. He said, look, I can't afford to have you get mad. He said, you, he said, everybody else has a, a lot of burdens, but you have been able to stay calm. That's the reason I have you there. And he said, you have to think as clearly and as conservatively as you can, because that gives me more room in the middle to make a decision that is tactically correct. And I can't, he said, I can get emotional and I can get killed tomorrow for nothing. He said, I'm not scared to die. I don't want, I, but I'm, I don't want to die over a whole bunch of frustration and anger. I want to give my life to something I believe in. And if you don't remain calm and rational, if you're going to get as angry as everybody else, I don't need you. And so that's the reason why I would say in answer to that first question, the, the best uh, understanding of the prison pipeline um, it's really a third grade prison pipeline uh, is uh, one of Dr. Ford's colleagues at Ohio State, uh, Dr. Alexander. And I forget the name of the book, but it's a, it's a brilliant analysis of the attempt to put mostly black men, but black men and women, uh, in prison, and what she reveals is that they start deciding how many prisons they need by who gets put out of school in third grade. And so there's systematic, there's systemic things that we have to deal with, and we can't afford to be angry. We've got to be as quiet and calm and thoughtful and precise as we possibly can. My daddy used to smack me around, don't get mad, get smart. See, if you lose your temper in a fight, you're gonna lose the fight. Now, I'm 88 and I've been at this a long time, but the guys who were too angry, too frustrated, they didn't get killed. See, they got ulcers, they had heart attacks. Very few of the so-called militants, there's a certain level of militancy that hurts you. And that's why with the background that she has and the experience that she has and the degrees that she has, I want to urge my sister, you know, don't get mad, use your smarts. Because it's, it's going to take people like you to answer these problems. It doesn't do a damn thing to complain about them. Nobody gives a damn about us, and even <laughs> us don't give a damn about us a lot of times. I'm sorry, but, I gotta laugh. I'm, I'm laughing. You are right <laughs> on it, Ambassador Young. I'm sorry, no. I'm interrupting your time. No, yeah. that's okay. okay. But I, 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 I heard your introduction, see? And you are a brilliant, wonderful woman in a critical position in the American educational establishment. See? And every question you have, 
I mean, every charge you make is right on target. But it doesn't do anybody any good to make them. Pick one or two of those and say, I'm going to devote myself to wiping this one out. And that's how we did the civil rights movement. We started with a bus boycott. We went from the bus boycott to the freedom rides, I mean, to the sit-ins, to the freedom rides. Where we are now is with the, um, the problems of poverty. All of the problems you face are ultimately economic problems. And our children are upset because mama's working, dad is working two jobs if he's there or if he's got too many children, he's given up and run off and left them there with the mama. Uh, but all of those are because the people we now call essential workers, nobody has paid them like they're essential and nobody thinks of them as, as thought of them as essential until right now. And we've got to find a way to bring this society together and solve these problems because they they are going to destroy us if we don't get a hold of them but we can't count on white people to do that i mean it's not that they don't want to they don't know any better and so you have to kind of help them and to find a win-win solution and uh, there's a win-win solution to every one of these problems that you so brilliantly articulated. So thanks very much. I'm going to need to run because this is U United Nations uh, Day, and I have a, an 11 o'clock thing on the United Nations. God bless you. It's good to know you, Sister Ford. Look forward to meeting you somewhere. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. I'm just so uh, honored and humbled. Thank you. Thank no, you, okay. Ambassador. Don't get humble. Don't just keep the fire. <laughs> but you, 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 you controlled it. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you so much, Ambassador Young. We have so many questions that are, are pouring in from all over the country, from our participants that are here. But Dr. Ford, the next question to you is, for the most part, how do we dismantle the white privilege in America? Dr. Ford. Well, I can't, I'm not gonna deal with it from an American perspective. I just, what, I'm sorry, what did Ambassador Young say? I, I think he's basically trying to get off and they are taking his technology apart, oh, thank you. Uh, okay, okay, so, um, you know, I, I, the United States issue, that's bigger than what I do. This is really not it. My my sphere of influence is education. And I just talked about it. How can we dismantle it? And that's in the educational um, setting. So what can you do in your classroom? So you, you, you can have any policies and procedures, curriculum, et cetera, uh, in, your, uh, in your district. When you close your door, and I know we have virtual learning now, but anyway, but when you uh, are with your students, what do you do um, to be an anti-racist educator? Um, how do you implement the standards and then modify them through um, a culturally responsive uh, lens? If you are, and that's just two examples, um, I'm not trying to promote my curricular model, but people can contact me about that later, my Bloom Banks matrix. Um, if you're an administrator, how do you uh, make sure, like you all are doing, Hendrix, I mean, and, and have um, professional development that is unapologetic. I mean, just look at the title of this and just look at who your speakers are. So how do we have professional development. So this be P to 12, and then let me quickly say higher ed. But how do we have P to 12 educators, I'm sorry, P to 12 um, administrators not be afraid to upset the status quo, not be upset to, um, ch to challenge the status quo, to do what's right for children. And that's the kind of, we need those kinds of leaders principals, administrators, ex um, assistant, I mean, superintendents, et cetera. 
And then for higher education, uh, you know, same thing. What courses are being required to make sure that current and future professionals, I don't just mean educators, I, I said professionals, are culturally competent and anti-racist. Let me stop there. Yes, and Dr. Ford, another, yes, another question comes forward is, you had mentioned earlier uh, that white females are the majority and they are automatically at fault. One of our participants wants you to elaborate on that statement, please. No, I did not use the word. Uh, okay, so are we still, can you hear me? So whoever asked that question, thank you, but I did not say automatically at fault. So this is where listening is a problem. I, ain't, I didn't say that. And it, it frustrates me that somebody would say that I said that. I said too often. And too often is a qualifier. It did not say all or automatically. So if you sense white females are 85, you know, 80, about 85% of the teaching profession, hell yeah, you're your, you, you matter in terms of your attitudes, your biases, and your stereotypes. Your implicit and your explicit biases matter. But I did not, I would, I am strategic enough. I am trained enough to not say automatically. I say it too often, and it is a damn problem. And is a problem. So I didn't say automatic. So this is where, it, you know, this session is about what, you know, um, uh, uh, what does, hold on, I'm getting frustrated now because uh, what does truth sound like? Truth doesn't sound like I said damn automatic. Good. Thank you so much. We got one final question because um, unfortunately we're running out of time here. But the question, uh, Dr. Ford, or perhaps the statement is, could you provide some advice for black women who are currently leaders in the educational system? Provide black women some advice who are leaders in the educational system. Peter 12. I'm sorry, what? Which, yes, which, yes, what? yes, yes. Could you provide some advice for black women who are leaders in the educational system P12? Yes. Well, okay, so my advice is, which I've never been a principal or superintendent in, um, in the educational system. But my advice is when you take on this responsibility, then you need to be clear up front what your position is in terms of anti-racist education and how you plan to address anti-blackness. So when you're on, when you're doing your interview, I mean, you can't be desperate because, by the way, if you uh, start this um, anti-racist, and I'm going to put an air quotes agenda later, you'll be looking for another job real soon. So why don't you, during your interview, be up front and talk about your anti-racist, anti-blackness um, problems? And um, that is my advice. Be real as you would in any relationship. And then when you're real in a relationship, they know up front who you are. So when I interview, I'm Donna, Dr. Ford. I'm sorry, when I interview, you get two of me, Dr. Donna Y. Ford, and you get Donna from Cleveland slash East Cleveland. I'm not playing with you about who I am. You're going to know who I am from the day you meet me, just like you just did in this little short keynote with follow-up questions. I don't have time to play. I curse. I'm upset. I'm angry. Angry can be empowering. And um, I'm unapologetically black angry with solutions. Again, to you, uh, Dr. Ford and Ambassador uh, Young, we are very appreciative and thank you so much. We want our panelists, uh, we want all of our listening audience members to know that Dr. Ford will be 
uh, continuing as one of our panelists in our education. So we encourage you uh, to uh, remote over there shortly. But we want again to thank you, Dr. Ford and Ambassador Young, uh, for being our keynote uh, speakers uh, this morning. Truly, we have more questions uh, than we have time for at this moment, but we look forward to hearing from you again in our panel. At this time, I would like to yield to Dr. Kimberly McLeod, who will introduce our special uh, guest that we have with us now, Dr. McLeod. Thank you, Dr. Hendricks. And thank you all um, for tuning in for What the Truth Sounds Like Symposium. And we got truth today. <laughs> And we know what it sounds like. We, we're beginning to understand what this feels like with the voice for those that are African-American and those that also advocate for any human to have equity and access at the table, what that means. And so it is with delight that I prepare to introduce to you um, two pioneers in this work that to me are evident that you don't have to be African-American to care about what happens to our, our communities and our children. Um, I wanna make sure, can you all still hear and see me? Sarah, thumbs up. Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. Okay, very good. Um, as I prepare to introduce to you Frank and Rosalie Turner, I wanna share with you a quote by Benjamin Franklin and he says, Justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. Uh, the first time I met the Turners, I was introduced to them as friends and, and collaborators uh, for the university. But once I got to know them and who they are and what they stand for, they not only have put their beliefs and their values and what they feel is right um, for equity, for opportunity, for access. They also put their money where their mouth is. And one of the first positive engagements that I've had with the university was with them, where they have committed $100,000 for an endowment, for an endowed professorship to lead this work in race and reconciliation. The Turners have worked collaboratively with the university for years in creating experiential journeys for our students to go on civil rights tours to meet the leaders of those movements in states across the country they have put their time where their map where their heart is they have put their behaviors are aligned it's not what they are saying it is what they are doing and i'm saying that because you don't have to be black to understand what it means to fight for equity for all. You don't have to be, you have to be human to care about what's happening to other humans. And that's part of this work. And so it is a great delight and a joy for me to share with you a, a couple, <laughs> two individuals who absolutely have aligned passion, who have aligned belief, who have aligned financial means, who have aligned their behaviors with reconciliation, with equity, with opportunity for all of our students, for our society as a whole, I wanna to introduce to you, Mr. and Mrs. Frank and Rosalie Turner. Well, thank you so much thank for you. that nice introduction. We're so honored to be part of this uh, symposium. And um, I love the title of it, um, what truth sounds like, because truth, is, as we've heard this morning, is made up of a lot of words like uh, institutional racism, white privilege, um, systemic racism, um, the pipeline issue, so many things that are of our concern today. And what I believe is that words and conversation can uh, lead to um, understanding and that understanding can lead to action and action can lead to change. Um, we've had chances for it in the past with uh, reconstruction and with the civil rights movement in the 60s. And that was effective, um, but it stopped short. I believe we're on the cusp of a change again and we have to go forward with it. Um, in 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama, 
the young people were ready to march. And they um, gathered together, but they didn't know the, the moment that they would be called upon. So the SCLC went to Parker High School and they held up a big sign and it simply said, it's time. And all the kids knew that was it. And they came pouring out of Parker High School, the doors and windows, they came from all the black schools around. They went down to 16th Street Baptist Church and the Children's March of 1963 happened. And within a month, President Kennedy was taking civil rights uh, uh, legislature to Capitol Hill. And we have that opportunity now. Um, we ha we're having conversations. Those conversations can lead to understanding. That understanding can lead to action. And that action can lead to change, which we desperately need in our culture of our country today. So I believe this symposium is just another way of our holding up signs to the country saying, it's time, it's time. Thank you, Ro. I wanna talk a little bit about <clears throat> systemic racism. It's real, it's effective, it's sometimes silent and always painful. I wanna share with you a few examples of systemic racism I have observed through the years. In 1967 and 1968, I served this country as in the Republic of Vietnam as a United States Marine Corps officer. I served alongside many outstanding black Marines only to find out when they returned to, to the States, they were denied lodging, they were denied food, and they were denied opportunity, which made me think I wonder how many black veterans of all wars of this country came back from the battlefield to the states and found the lack of lodging, food, and opportunity. In a community where we lived in Virginia, a black couple that we knew taught math, English, and coached basketball in an integrated high school. They could not live in our neighborhood, not because they couldn't afford it, they could. It was simply because their skin was black. I was born in 1939. In case you haven't noticed, I was born white. In 1961, I graduated from an all white college known as East Texas State, now known as Texas A&M University at Commerce. In 1961, being a college graduate and being white, there were many opportunities that lay in front of me, some of which I took advantage of. Had I been born black in 1939, I suspect many of these opportunities, if any of them, would have been, uh, would not have existed for me. Our goal is to help every student, black, brown, Asian, and especially white students to better understand systemic racism and its consequences. With the leadership of Dr. Rudin, Dr. Humphreys, Dr. McLeod, Dr. Hendricks, Dr. Miller, and other staff and faculties, we are confident that working together we can get this done. It's, it's time. time. <laughs> thank, Th you. thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Frank and, and Rosalie for sharing with us. Now, very uh, two important uh, pieces of information I'd like to share with all of our participants as we prepare to uh, transition into our breakout sessions. First of all, uh, if you do not have an email with a link uh, to your pre-selected uh, breakout room, you can click on the links that are provided below here in uh, platform Q. And then secondly, after the uh, breakout, uh, please return to our general assembly room where we are right here. You will also have a moderator with you in each of the breakout sessions. They will also provide you with additional information to transition back to our general assembly room. At 11.45 a.m., you will also be receiving an email uh, from platform Q to transition you back here to the uh, main uh, breakout, main, the main uh, room here. So again, to you, Frank and Rosalie, thank you so much. And we look forward to transitioning now to our breakout sessions. Dr. Hendricks, before we break, 
let me just say one quick thing. This is Kimberly McLeod again. Um, Turners, you all are fabulous. I'm getting private texts coming to me just saying how impactful and powerful your message was. As you all are preparing to transition to your breakouts, let me tell you, these breakouts are, at the panelists in them are phenomenal. Um, Donna Ford and Andrew Young talked about the school to prison pipeline. In the criminal justice breakout session, you have Judge Teske, who basically saw a rise of juveniles coming through the system and said, I'm not going to see another student until you fix what's happening in the school system. The school system, the judges, the, the, um, all of them came together and changed the condition. They disrupted and dismantled that school to prison pipeline. You get to learn about that in that session. In the education session, you have the superintendent of HISD, an African-American female that's leading the largest school district in the state of Texas. You have school board members. You have individuals that will talk about working with exceptional children. Our break, any one of the panelists in our breakout sessions are so talented that they could be the keynote by themselves. In and one of the other things I want to emphasize about the breakout session is we talk about what the truth looks like, sounds like. It's not only hearing this, but understanding what policies that we have to comply to as they are passed down to us. Part of this is understanding how these policies are written, who is writing them, and how we can have influence on what is being said before it is something that we have we have to create. In the elected officials, breakout session, you have one of the key authors of the African American Studies curriculum that push that. You can ask those questions. You have Senator Royce West. You have some dynamic leaders in all of these breakout sessions, in the faith-based community, in the mental health. All of these breakout sessions were designed to give you exactly what you need and want to hear the song, to hear the, the melody of what we can do different, to go back to our communities, to empower any and all children who are marginalized and are not getting what they need. We can fix that. We as individuals, we can do it alone. We can do it collectively. We can do it together. And it doesn't matter what color you are. You as a human can affect children who are not getting equity and access. And most of those children now that are at the bottom of almost every demographic category there is are your African-American children. And so this is an opportunity for us to get ideas, to have conversation and have dialogue with the people who have done the work, evidence of the work, and also are able to help you um, design your own pathway to success. So as you prepare to break out, 